Hey guys, so welcome or welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Adora Yin and today I'm going to be talking about how I got 790 in English on my SAT. So I filmed a vlog of taking my SAT for the third time and I took the June 2025 one. And yeah, I got some questions on how I prepared for it. So I compiled a list of my best tips that I will be sharing with you on my iPad here. So I'm gonna be looking at it and telling you guys my best secrets and strategies to getting that 790. And I've been dreaming about the 790 for an entire year. As I said, it took me three whole tries and I've always just been better at the math section. So improving my English took a lot of effort. Like my first try, I got, I, I don't even remember now, but it was like, seven like 30 or something on English and then my second try I got 750 or 760 on English and then finally I improved and I got 790 on my final try and that was done like I'm done with it I don't need a higher score like I put so much effort into it so I'm very very pleased with my score even though it's not perfect but you know you can't always be perfect so yeah without further ado I'm going to be sharing with you guys my tips also the reason why I look so dolled up is because I'm about to go to my own birthday celebration and yeah I did my nails I did not have my nails done when I took the SAT but anyway, let me actually get to sharing my top strategies. So the list I compiled, it's in order of how the test is going to work. And I'm just going to walk you through what goes on in my brain while I'm taking a test. So the way the English module works in the SAT, well, there's two, but in both modules, it starts with the reading section and then it goes to the writing section, which includes grammar and stuff. So I'm going to start talking about the reading section first. So the first thing I do when the exam starts in Blue Book, and this goes for not just in the actual exam, but also when you're doing the full length blue book practice tests that are available on the app. But the first thing I do is I immediately get rid of like the pop ups and then I turn on the tools in blue book. And I feel like not enough people talk about this, but it's actually so extremely useful for me. The ones I'm talking about are the highlight tools and the crossing off wrong answers tools. So immediately once I get there, um, that's my setup. And then I'm going to talk about why those are absolutely crucial later. But then the next thing you do, obviously, read the passage. And here is where the first tool comes in. I always, always, always highlight the passage as I read with the tool. Um, all you have to do is just like click and drag your finger across it. It's really easy. And I don't know, this just helps me like keep the retain the knowledge in my head and make sure that I recognize what like the actual subject is at hand. And this helps a lot, especially with longer pa paragraphs where there's a lot of different ideas going on. Um, usually I just stick to one color because I find that switching between colors is kind of time consuming, especially when the English modules are very, very, very tight on time. So yeah, I just stick to one color. Sometimes what I highlight is literally what the question is asking for. So yeah, that's why it's really helpful. The second thing I wanted to talk about while you're reading the passage, and if it's a subject that you recognize, do not bring in your outside knowledge into the passage. Every time you approach a new text, you have to be looking at it like you have zero outside knowledge because the answer is going to be in that text. Like it's for sure, definitely in that text. I noticed that sometimes College Board, they're very sneaky. They try to trick you in the answer choices and sometimes they say stuff that are factually true and you may know that they are factually true. However, if it is not stated in the text, it is not the answer. Because what, what the SAT is looking for is how well you read the text um, and how well you understand the text, not how much outside knowledge you have um, about like whatever it is, like geography, history, like science, whatever it is, do not bring in your outside knowledge. Okay, and then the third thing is, I feel like it does always go without saying, but I feel like that was definitely one of the mistakes that I always made when I started this whole entire SAT preparation process, and that is not skipping any words while you're reading. Don't skip any sentences or any words. You may feel like the answer is blaringly obvious and you may just wanna to get to the point, but trust me, in the harder questions, you have got to be like acknowledging every single word and may not be crucial in the answer. But the thing is, while you're reading it, you don't know what's going to be crucial in the answer yet. And what I find is it's usually better reading it thoroughly and understanding every single sentence thoroughly before you approach the answer than having to look at the question and then keep on rereading the text because you just never got the main point. So yeah, in the long run, I feel like rereading the entire paragraph is so much more effective than 
like trying to pick at the information afterwards because once you understand the entire paragraph you have a better sense of it and you know it better in your head and my fourth tip is don't be afraid of using your scratch paper in an English exam. Now, I feel like people also do not talk about this enough, but I found it extremely useful, especially in the longer ones or like the more science-based questions, because in those long paragraphs, there's so many ideas floating around. And sometimes you just need to jot them down to make sure to keep your brain focused and make sure you understand the relationship between what is going on in the like the different subjects in the paragraphs. And yeah, that's why I say that it's especially useful in science because there may be different variables and one may lead to another one, for example, increasing. So then in that case, while I'm reading it, I jot down really brief notes with the scratch paper that they provide with you. Every exam center will provide you with scratch paper, by the way. And I just jot down like, for example, A arrow B, like, you know what I mean? A arrow B, like, and then up arrow for increasing, like that kind of stuff, like very simple notes. It should not take time, but that's how you clear your mind on the relationships. And yeah, it's also super good for eliminating answer choices which I will get onto later. Okay, and then the next part is when you are done reading the paragraphs and you wanna rush onto the answers, but my strategy is to think of the answer in my head first. That way you're not like distracted by the answer choices that they're giving you because most of the time, they're trying to catch you out. They're trying to trick you, okay? The SAT is not playing nice. College Board is not playing nice. They're trying to trick out everybody that they can trick out, okay? So basically what I do is answer it in my head first, and then I read the answer choices very, very carefully, and I see which one is most suited to what I had in my head. Now, sometimes you might not find it immediately, and in that scenario, you have to start eliminating your answer choices. And this is where the crossing out tool comes in very handy because since you already had that tool loaded up, it stays on your screen and then you can just cross it out while you're thinking about it and while you're reading through your answer choices. And my strategy while reading through those choices is to carefully consider every single word. Just like with reading the paragraph, every little word in the answer choice can make a difference in the answer. Like just one word can change the meaning of the answer and make it incorrect. That's why I say that you have to read it extremely carefully. Sometimes answer choices can be too specific, like focusing on too narrow of an idea when that is not what the text is talking about. Sometimes they can be too broad or generalizing a relationship that doesn't exist. And as I said previously, it could be generalizing something that is factually correct, except it's not what is it's not what the passage is talking about. Another type of wrong answer is when it flips the relationship. And that's why I said jotting down notes is important. Sometimes the answer choice is insinuating that B causes A when in fact A causes B. And if you use my tactic earlier and you look down on your notes, you'll know that that is immediately wrong because it should be A arrow B. So that's how you know to eliminate wrong answers. And another key strategy with this is being extremely suspicious of extreme words. And by extreme words, I mean words like always, never, all, and only. Um, and I saw this trick in a book before. And when I noticed it and I started, and I started clocking it in the actual um, practice papers, I realized that that is one big trick that College Board continuously uses to trick us. So you have to be very wary of those. A lot of the times, those answers are not correct. But that is not to say that they're never going to be correct, but just be a little bit more suspicious of those. And then after that, after that entire process, you should be confident in your answer. If you don't know the answer, however, you should have some crossed out and you're probably fighting between the two closest choices. Um, and in that case, just put, just click the most likely one and then use the flag button and come back to it after you're done and you're reviewing it. Okay, and I just wanted to make another point about specific question types, specifically being the vocab questions at the start. I know a lot of people who grind out SAT vocab and have like all these flashcard sets, but personally, I did not do that. I like, I did not memorize like the top 500 SAT words. What I did instead was I would compile the words that I did not know, but I noticed that they were constantly occurring. Um, and then I just wrote it down and put it on a sticky note and kept on looking at it until it got in my brain. Um, and yeah, like the reason I say that is because I feel like memorizing all those words is not actually that useful because they only make up a few questions. And also you could be memorizing 500 words and you don't even know if those 500 words are coming on the test. So there's so many other things that you could do to improve your score rather than just 
purely memorizing vocabulary and like not doing anything active in your brain to like think about answers. Because I feel like the crux of the SAT is more about how you think and understand the questions rather than um, which words you know, because a lot of the times there's context clues that tell you or like insinuate what a word means, which is why you don't really need to focus on memorizing those words when you have the skills to understand it based on the context that that word is in. So hope that is helpful. And then moving on to the writing section, which is mostly focused on grammar. I was very humbled when I took my first practice test because I thought that my grammar was amazing. Turns out it was not what I thought it was. And I realized that there were so many grammar rules that I did not actually no, or just like was not aware of because I don't know why they just never really taught like specific grammar rules in class. So what I did to learn them, I used Khan Academy. It's free. It's completely free. You do not need like $1,000 session tutors. Like trust me, I did. Okay, I took the SAT. I had no tutors throughout the entire process. I did not pay for any resources. I used only purely free online resources, which I'll get to later. Um, but yeah, I just used the Khan Academy and they have like little text written modules um, teaching you the basic grammar rules. And it's really helpful. It's like listed in tables and stuff. Um, and you could just screenshot those for the ones that you don't know and just like keep it in a document. And yeah, once you learn all of those, it's the grammar section just becomes exponentially easier. Um, but I did note down like a few tips that I found like extremely helpful out of all the grammar rules and basically always come up on the test. One of them is that when there is a sentence and there's a comma and an and word that equals a period. And that conversion is really useful in not only the punctuation questions, but also the fill in the blank questions. Another key thing for the punctuation questions is learning that the period and the semicolon are interchangeable. I did not realize that before because they never taught us about semicolons in school. But like, after, after doing Khan Academy, I knew. And another thing that's really important for the transition questions, which you can also find out more about in Khan Academy, but at first I did have quite some difficulty with them until I realized that the key thing is that you have to read the neighboring sentences where the transition blank word is supposed to be, and you have to figure out the relationship between them. And once you figure that out, you can easily find the transition word because you'll realize that these transition words, they're all categorized. So for example, for emphasis transition words, they'll be in fact, indeed, that kind of stuff. For exemplification, it'll obviously be something like for example. And then if, uh, if the second sentence is adding to the previous sentence, then you'll use a transition word like furthermore or moreover. And then if the two sentences have two different subjects that are being compared, you use something like like, likewise, or similarly. And yeah, those are the main ones. Um, as for cause and effect relationship sentences, where the first sentence is talking about something that causes the second sentence, then it'll be something like, because accordingly as such to that end. And the last sentence relationship type is a contradiction where it's expressing different ideas. So then in that case, the transition words would be like, still, in any case, and rather. So these are just like notes that I had down um, while, you know, reviewing for uh, my SAT English. And now for the last section of this video, I'm going to be talking about free resources. So the first one, as I mentioned, I did Khan Academy English course, and I just did the entire one. It's really useful because it breaks it down into the different categories of skills that you need. And if you're tight on time, you can take the course challenge. And then it basically compiles questions of every single question type. And based off the ones that you get wrong, it'll tell you which areas that you need to focus on. And then with that, you can take that and then go into the skill specific lessons and master that. And the reason why I like Khan Academy personally is that it, it really gamifies it. Like there's a point system and everything. So it was really entertaining to me. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like that's kind of a study hack as well, just like gamifying it. Um, that's why these online resources are really good. And then the second one, which is also really important was the SAT suite question bank. Now, I feel like not enough people know about this either, but it's this completely free question bank resource by College Board of previous questions, as well as um, like just other practice questions that they make. And they compiled it into an entire question bank. And similarly, you can filter and categorize them 
um, by which skills that you find the hardest and practice all of them. And in total, there's like almost 4,000 questions, I think. Like there's quite a lot. Like it'll take you a while to finish it. That's why I'm saying like, you really do not need to be paying for all these external resources when the free resources are right in front of your face. And I feel like arguably it's the best one out there as well because it's written by the people that are making the exam. So like, why would you be paying for external tutors or like, you know, extor external websites that are making up their own questions when they're not the ones writing the test, you know? So the SAT question bank, that was my freaking holy grail. I did every single question every single damn question and yeah i feel like that definitely improved my skills by so much um because it, doing all those practice questions you start to notice a pattern in the question types and like the way that they try to trick you and stuff and you also get to practice like the way your brain pathways work and the way you think of the answers um so yeah it was extremely helpful um and what i did i just pulled it off on um I just had it up on my laptop and then as you can see here I would just like write down the multiple choice letter in this book and then I would check it after um I don't know if you can see okay. but like yeah as I said I did every single question and I feel like that definitely helped me so much also one key strategy that I use while doing all these questions is even though it may seem tedious I read every single answer explanation that they wrote from college board so after you do a question, it'll tell you uh, the correct answer, obviously, but it'll also have an answer explanation for why each answer choice that is wrong is wrong. Like it will explain in great detail in like huge chunks about why A is wrong, why B is wrong, why C is wrong, and why D is correct, you know? So reading all those, even though it's like so much text, one, it helps you start thinking like the college board. Like I noticed after I started reading so many answer explanations, um, and then I was just doing practice questions on my own, I started noticing that the way my brain would figure out that an answer is wrong and cross it off was exactly the way that College Board did. And that's what I mean when I say you start thinking like College Board, like you start knowing like how College Board is trying to trick you. Sorry, I'm like painting out College Board as like the evil person, by the way. It's just like, like us against the exam people, you know? And yeah, you figure it out. Like you figure out their sneaky little tactics and you know how to beat that. And like through that, you can literally beat any single question. Um, once you think like College Board, like you're literally becoming the test writer yourself. And that's the way I thought about it. And obviously that strategy worked for me and it got me to where I am. And yeah, another thing is for the question bank, it's also categorized by easy, medium and hard questions. Um, so yeah, depending on how good, how bad or how weak you are at a certain like language skill you can choose the medium easy hard questions and just like keep on drilling it just keep on going you know personally for me the reason why I also did the easy questions is because I wanted to like not trip myself out when I get to easy questions because I feel like one common pitfall is thinking that a an answer cannot be that straightforward and then therefore choosing a different answer when in reality the answer is actually simple so yeah I just wanted to do all the different type of questions but I would say that if you are tight on time obviously just focus on the harder ones if that's what you're targeting to like completely perfect your score and yeah that's all the notes that I have written down today for the SAT English section and I will be doing a video on the SAT math section which I got an 800 on on my second try and that will probably be the next video and yeah, make sure to leave a comment if you have any questions. Also make sure to subscribe, leave a like on the video, and also comment any other video suggestions you have. And finally, thanks for watching, and I wish you guys the best of luck on the SAT, and I hope you get it on the first try, unlike me. <laughs>